Our team members are Eric Dill, myself, Daniel Given, Adam Guarino, Brett Tortorich, and Ivan Yusuf. We will be presenting the design of a semi-submersible heavy lift ship. This is what we will be discussing this evening, and I will begin here with an introduction. To begin, we performed a market analysis of the offshore oil industry. We decided to focus specifically on several undeveloped oil fields off the coast of Brazil in 5,000 meters of water. These installations include very large spar and semi-submersible style platforms, such as the Tahiti spar and Thunder Horse platform shown here. There are only about 50 ships in the world which can submerge their main deck intentionally, and only a few can handle large installations, such as the Dockwise Mighty Serpent 1 with the Tahiti and the Blue Marlin shown carrying the Thunder Horse platform. Although we targeted the oil industry, there is a need for a vessel which can support the transport of other systems such as intact or damaged Navy ships. This picture shows the USS Cole on board the Blue Marlin after being bombed in the Gulf of Aden. We focused on designing a vessel that is cheaper to operate with increased efficiency in transport and salvage. Next, Adam will introduce you to the whole design of our vessel. Thank you, Daniel. Um, all new vessel designs begin with the um, with the hull design, and to create ours, we started with started with a set of curves, as you can see on the left. Uh, then we lofted a surface through it, and on the right, you can see the wireframe view of that surface. Here's the original resulting surface, and below it is the rendered view. A few things to notice about this um, shape is a large cargo deck um, that extends all the way to the transom. The huge cutout you see that's where the cargo will rest. Uh, the bulbous bow, which is there to re uh, reduce wave resistance, and also the gentle sloping stern, uh, which will accommodate our propulsion types. Here's some modifications that were made to the hull. Um, the, hope, the reason uh, for the, you can see the top view, we have a gentle slope, upslope at the uh, bow. The reason for this is to de decrease slamming loads um, on the vessel in rough seas. And below that, you can see some curvature refinement that was made up in the bulb. Some information about this design. Um, the overall length is 250 meters with a beam of 60 meters and a low line draft of 11.81 meters. This max submerged draft is 31 meters for this vessel. And while we're on the slide, um, I'll tell you we're a we're class ABS DPS 2 vessel as a heavy lift transport vessel with a crew complement of 55 feet. So, how do we compare with other vessels in the industry of this type? Uh, well, when submerged, this ship has 15 meters of water over the main deck, which means we can carry a wide range of deep draft cargoes. Uh, the ship can operate on anything from heavy fuel oil to natural gas. Uh, the propulsion plant can, so and no other ship, no, no other heavy lift ship can operate on these multiple types of fuel. The deck area <coughs> and the deadweight capacity are more than any other heavy lift ship in the world. And it's class DP2, which is rare among heavy lift vessels, and has the ability to double as a liquid product tanker. Uh, when, not mo when mobilized without a cargo, and the capacity on the liquid product is equivalent to that of a Panamax sized tanker. So we prepared, we, uh, prepared a little video for you guys, so you can kind of see what an actual lift would look like. And I'll play that now. Okay. Here's just a standard rig that we would lift. This is a vessel moving into position, submerging down to our 31 meter draft, centering underneath the cargo, de-ballasting back up, lifting the cargo, sailing with. Show that one more time without me narrowing. Kind of get a feel for what this vessel can do. And now I will hand it over to Iman, who's going to talk about our tank arrangement. The ship has a sophisticated tank arrangement that satisfies the mission. The tank arrangement is based on a 70 day voyage with a range of 25,000 nautical miles distributed between heavy fuel oil, HFO tanks, and natural gas, NG tanks. 
HFO tanks are based are based uh, uh, are sized based on 15,000 nautical miles. NG tanks are sized based on 10,000 nautical miles. HFO is used when the ship is on transit because it's a cheaper oil. While NG is used where the use of HFO is restricted due to the strict emission regulations. GHS is used to size the tanks to match the required liquid capacity. Most tanks are sized to submerge the ship to a draft of 31 meters with a volumetric displacement of about 164,000 nautical miles out of the total tank's capacity of about 100 uh, sorry, 180,000 cubic meters. We have 56 balls tanks on board to decrease the free surface effect, maintain an even keel through submergence, and improve damage stability. Now we are looking at the render review of the tanks. NG and HFO tanks are positioned close to the engine room. Uh, Fresh water tanks and the other service tanks are positioned close to the bow. Plus tanks are positioned all over the length of the ship. We also see a center line access corridor for main power cables for stern azipods, vein piping for all tanks aft of LNG compartment leading to stern. Timbal's tanks in the power loop body are isolated and contained away from the shell and are fitted with heating coils and removable manifolds so they can be used as liquid product tanks when the ship is mobilizing without a payload. By doing so, we've increased the money-making opportunity of the vessel. Next, Adam will be talking about propulsion. Okay, this slide shows a few of the resistance estimates that we use for the vessel. Uh, as you can see, most of them are pretty Pretty similar, so we feel like uh, we have some pretty good results. Uh, we're going to go with the hull trip as used in max surf, kind of medium in there. Um, so you can see the hull trip as used in max surf with the still water condition and also the sea state 2 condition. We're going to go ahead and use the sea state 2 data just to ensure that we make speed. So um, after incorporating some a 10% design margin as well as you know, accounting for some propeller inefficiencies. Uh, we determined that the total stern power required for the propulsors is uh, to go 15 knots, it's about 24 megawatts. Combine this with our 2.6 megawatt hotel load that was calculated and add in some additional electrical inefficiencies and you get about 29.5 total installed power for this vessel. So I'm going to supply that power. We went ahead and did a trade study. We went ahead and did a trade study. Uh, the options were between Wattzilla multi-fuel engines MAK standard diesels and GE gas turbines. Each criterion was given a relative score and the overall best choice was the water multi-fuel engines. So we went ahead and chose three nine-cylinder gensets as well as one six-cylinder genset totaling just over 30 megawatts. As I said, these engines can operate on many types of fuel from natural gas to heavy fuel oil. Um, in natural gas mode, the the fuel burns extremely clean and meets the tier 3 IMO rule set, which, which this vessel will be required to do. And when operating on HFO, the, gas would need, the exhaust would need to be cleaned, and we have an exhaust cleaning system on board the vessel for that case. So here's an image of the uh, stern propulsors that we chose to go with, these Azipod propulsors. These pods are forward-facing to allow for greater propeller efficiencies and also can rotate 360 degrees for great ship maneuverability. To abide by our VP2 rules, we have redundant Rolls-Royce bow thrusters with controllable pitch props. As for the layouts, we start with the lowest level in the engine compartment. Uh, these are our four gen sets that I just talked about. The center is the pump room with all the water ballast tanks, as well as our rapid air uh, compression deballasting system for rapid deballasting if that's needed. And to the right is the bow thruster room with the access. The next level up, um, to the right is the compartment for the generator and engine controls and all electrical distribution equipment. You can see the redundancy required for EP2. And the final machinery space, uh, this view shows the engine exhaust lines running to the main auxiliary space. Uh, to the left is the compartment for LNG storage. The engines are run off natural gas, but it's stored um, as LNG. 
can store a lot more on the vessel, obviously, and uh, 